Well, today is the last day of school. <laughs> so, a summer's eve, I guess you could call it. I'm Virginia Hope Steve Melvin. For those of you who I haven't met, I oversee the speaker series and we co chair Lipson over there. Say, so raise your hand, Kathy. <laughs> oh, our education and outreach community. Tonight, I'm delighted to welcome Reagan Khan, who I discovered in the press Democrat when I was so I always look at the newspapers and baby for magazine and a bunch of other magazines to see who's out there that might be an interesting speaker that will be related in some way to plants and animals. <laughs> and um, there was a lovely write-up of Bacon's new book, illustrated by Shane Ware. Could you raise your hand, Shane? Yay. Yeah. <laughs> and Shane's the illustrator. <laughs> And we have some of his prints available. Um, but Layton has an interesting background. It's in, what she is a person of multiple interests and uh, skill, diverse skills. You were a student at Sonoma State, you were an employee at Sonoma State. Um, she was the uh, head of the fiction program in the Napa Writer, Napa Writers Conference for eight years, she said. Yeah. And uh, is currently pursuing photography, although she spent 12 years studying violin and tabla at Ali Akbar Khan College of Music in San Miguel. <laughs> so we have a woman with diverse talents and interests who's going to share her fascination with the campus uh, at Sonoma State. It has a fascinating history. And um, she'll have book, copies of her book available for sale. After the talk, and there are prints over there by Shane Ware. Yes. Yes, that might be available. So, and you, and you can have forgotten? No, I think you got it all. Where, where did you go? Uh, upstate New York, okay. north of the Adirondacks. Were you interested in the outdoors then? Okay. Well, we used to spend summers on a lake, um, the Racket Lake in, in the Adirondacks. And so, this was back in the day. I remember when when we could actually get a radio there. So we used to spend most of our summers just swimming. That was all we did was we would get up and swim until um, my mom would make us take a, a nap. So now that we needed a nap, I think she was just tired of being at the beach because <laughs> we would just be in the water the whole time. So we were very much, you know, under trees, playing in logs, you know, skipping stones. And we used to spend the afternoon taming uh, chipmunks. <laughs> Well, tonight we're going to hear talk about the campus. So I certainly didn't know that. So it's going to be a worthwhile talk. I'm going to turn it over to you. Later. All right. Thank you very much, Virginia. Really appreciate the introduction. Okay. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank the CNPS for inviting us here to talk and share this book with you and the drawings. And I uh, thank Virginia for that lovely introduction and for for her original invitation, which was um, a delight, actually. Um, excuse me for a second, I might have to talk. <coughs> and I do want to give a, a wave of gratitude to my writing group who really helped shepherd this book into being. And Sally Weir is here as our representative of that. And then of course the group introduced me to Shane Weir, the printmaker, and who was our professor at Sonoma State for almost 30 years. Yeah. And the, this, uh, his drawings really made this book into a bestiary. And um, many of his prints are in galleries worldwide, the British Museum in London, right? The Library of Congress in DC, San Francisco MoMA, Oka Museum, Robert Mondavi Collection, and of course in the permanent collection at Sonoma State among places that are way too numerous to mention. I mean, the list goes on like this, but um, I, the book is really honored and really created by these drawings. And I really love the fact that we were able to establish this collaboration. And we took many little walks around Sonoma State and you know, he, his love of that place really shows up in his drawings of the animals and the, and the birds and the place. Um, and without this illustrations, as I said, this book would not be a true bestiary. Let's 
So this is uh, one of the drawings from the book. These are the Ravens on Stevenson Hall um, by Shane Rear. Should we turn the lights down? You could do that. Oh, okay. Uh, you might have to help me with this. How uh, do do this? Do I have to end the show? Okay, guys, I'm sorry. Can we do that? Let me go down to Zoom. Share screen. This. Okay. Okay. All right. Sorry, technology. Here we go. And onward. And this is Shane's work. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not used to the speaker the microphone thing. I'm going to blow out the microphone. Okay, so what say many of you is a bestiary? Bestiaries are collections of stories, tales, facts about our animal compatriots, and sometimes plants <clears throat> like mandrake or cedar or a few minerals like agate are included sometimes. The earliest bestiary has been traced back to a Greek text titled Physiologist meaning the naturalist in the second or possibly the fourth century ACE. And now that we're talking about the way back in time, I do wanna remind you all to turn off your phones. If your phone is on, I did have to do that. So while you're doing that, while this first text is lost to us, we know of it from its many translations into Latin, Old English, Middle English, French, Syrian. Bestiaries have existed from well has existed well into the modern times um, and used in many schools in Britain until the mid 19th 20th century. And there was a translation that was printed in, uh, by T.H. White in the 1960s, it, uh, translated finally into regular English, from, uh, old English. That was a labor of love. Um, think of all those lovely manuscripts from the Middle Ages with their beasts and tales and gold leaf lettering and illustrations. The stories and facts about these animals, many local and recognizable like the ant and the weasel, some far away and exotic like the rhinoceros or giraffe or lion, some imagined and metaphorical like the phoenix or manticore or let's go back to the griffin, isn't that pretty amazing? Um, or a paradexion tree. The stories came from authorities like Pliny the Elder and merged with those of Isidore, Seville, and others. They were collected from all over and then it distilled into uh, all these various stories. While the original physiologist only had 48 chapters, one per creature, over time, other chapters were added or deleted or modified or expanded. Descriptions were shared with, uh, from travelers with an eager audience. And so at th times, things became garbled. The rhinoceros, accurately described as having a hide as thick as armor, was then drawn as if wearing a metal suit of armor with the joints of hip and knee held together with rivets and bolts. This picture by Durer, a more recent interpretation from 1515, is a case in point. Accurate in some ways, but fanciful in many others. But what makes the best jury more than an encyclopedia of facts is that they were written by Christian writers who included a moral gloss reflecting their faith in most, though not all, of the stories. They sought to show the ways our God manifested in the natural world, proving his existence and verity of their, their sorry, proving his existence and the verity of their theology. For instance, an eagle roams the skies looking up, keeping his eyes and heart on God and heaven. The pelican, in one famous story, I don't know if they put a little, there's the pelican here, is quite bereft over the death of her chicks. She yanks out her breast feathers and three drops of blood spill on the chicks. 
miraculously reviving them, an obvious reference to the Trinity and the resurrection of Christ. Bestiaries also included some minerals like agate, as I said, and trees like the cedar tree and the paradexion tree. This is the paradexion tree in case you didn't recognize it. <laughs> it grows in India, it was said, and attracts doves, the good folks on one side of the tree and dragons or the devil on the other. Can't really tell, but here you can see the doves up here and the devils are these guys down here. Staying on the correct side keeps the doves safe from dragons, keeps good Christians safe from the devil. Over the centuries, the form evolved and was adopted by other kinds of creeds or beliefs. Think of the immense bestiaries of the Dungeons and Dragons Codexes or of Jorge Luis Borges' Book of Imaginary Beasts, reflecting his belief in imagination and creativity. I, I love this book. I don't know if anybody else has read it, but it's just full of the most amazing creatures. <laughs> I like to think that this bestiary reflects the codes of environmentalism and respect for the land and all the life upon it. And so I will start reading uh, from chapter one um, called Abounding Surrounding, which begins on page 25. This is going to be kind of a mixed, mixed construction. Abounding surrounding. The true meaning of life, Wesley, is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to sit. Nelson Henderson, a Manitoban farmer, to his son upon his graduation day. Lately, it seems, we've been playing the idea of fall, like a cat with a piece of string. It's mid-September, and the weather is all which away catty mumpus. Turned around. The afternoons explode with heat. Mornings and evenings are fringed with chilly, damp air. Some days we suspect it might rain before nightfall. The next afternoon we'll be yearning for the swimming pool. Around campus, leaves collect in discreet, scratchy piles. Heavily acorns crunch underfoot. Suddenly we see the trees, trees that have been camouflaged in swaths of green all summer are now shouting for attention, liquid ambers bursting out in vibrant red crowns, yellow poplars twittering in the wind, all inflamed by the skewed and tilted afternoon sun. We work on a tree-rich campus from the proud and stirring redwoods standing sentinel along the main entrance to the flowering varieties found in pockets all around the campus, to the willows and native species at the northern back edge of by Copeland Creek. All the more amazing when we recall that 40 years ago, this was farmland, valued for its flat, sun-drenched, unshaded, tree-less expanse. I learned from Karen Tillinghast, lead gardener and director of the native plant and butterfly gardens, that when the builders broke ground for the campus, she said, aside from the willows along the creek, there were only two trees when the campus started, both of which are still here. One, a shaggy eucalyptus, stands by the pedestrian bridge to the M lots over Copeland Creek. The other, a large cypress, haunts the anthropology lab by, in the facilities yard. All other trees, well over 100 varieties, have been planted by the university's landscapers and gardeners. Planted and well-designed, it is not by chance that our campus resembles an arboretum. While the original plan included fast-growing alders and poplars <coughs> chosen to soften the stark, almost brutal concrete walls of Stevenson and Darwin Halls, other trees were selected for the long-term, anticipating the pleasure of future generations. The red oaks still considered Young now will be heritage trees in another 30 to 40 years. The redwoods, though they are fast starters, hard to believe that those trees, some already 100 feet high, aren't even 50 years old yet. They should be around for the next millennium. Walking around campus, 
it quickly became apparent to me that the landscape designers and gardeners have made wise and wonderful choices about tree varieties, shapes, and colors. The grove-like arrangements of pines and oaks, the careful placement of magnolias within courtyards, well, actually it's been changed. The vista eastwards towards the lake, towards Alumni Grove, a sight line which resembles a living work of art with its deliberate balance of tree shape, color and line, a view ever changing yet always stunning. What better place to experience the melancholy brilliance of fall? Jillian has told me that the trees were chosen not just for their aesthetic attributes, but also for their ability to create a welcoming environment for creatures particularly native species, now and into the future. This was a premise stated in the Master Land Use Plan of Sonoma State University, written in 1969. The variety of trees, the varying heights, the deliberate arrangements of many habitats encourage, um, sorry, encourage critters of all stripes and feathers to set up housekeeping on our campus. Small berry producing trees and shrubs provide safe cover and chow for the ground birds. Taller trees provide the canopy favored by the high, higher flyers. Groves and thickets lure woodland animals. Owls, swallows, quail, towhees, squirrels, shrews, foals, and foxes. All have been invited in by a premise that the campus, by a promise the campus made 50 years ago that it continues to be fulfilled. This is a little, the Buckeyes, they're just bursting out lately. It's an magnificent thing. When the founders opened the doors of the new California State Teachers College in 1961 and leased business buildings in Rona Park, there were no students here either. They acted in faith, confident that by putting in the roots of this institution, they were providing the education for generations of students they couldn't expect to see, but were confident would arrive. And in the same way, the education each student receives now will enrich not only their own lives, but their children's and their children's children, like the spreading limbs of a great oak, sending acorns well out into the future. As the days grow shorter, colder, and inevitably wet, wetter this fall, the trees hold firm, anchoring and protecting all of us against the winter weather ahead, holding onto their implicit promise to flaunt brilliant blooms and new colors come spring and summer and fall and millennia. Okay, so that was uh, the beginning of, uh, that was the kind of the end of fall, beginning of winter. This book came about because I was often wandering around campus uh, when I was working in um, School of Science and Technology. So I would work at Irwin Hall and uh, would often just choose to, to uh, hand deliver projects rather than send them through, through the mail. I would go, I need to take a little walk and check on those owls over there at Stevenson. Um, I was always looking oh, for a way to kind of wander around and look for things to write about. And I was really struck by the richness of our habitat. The trees, the ponds, the fields, the wide variety of birds, little mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. Jean Wass, the publicity officer at the time, agreed to publish some of my essays in News Bites, which was the uh, university newsletter. And I had a, she would do that three or four times a semester. So those little deadlines really helped, I really enjoyed that. This particular, this next piece um, is about a special place on campus that is well worth the visit. And so we're going to go to the Butterfly Garden, page 89. Can you guys see me over this uh, flattening? Okay. The Butterfly Garden. It is mid-April and spring has been arriving in fits and starts. 
the few promising warm days interrupted by cold rain and gloomy skies. As we stop the plants and trees though, they are still bravely bursting forth with buds and pollen as we so sneezily notice. The butterflies are noticing as well, waking up from their winter sleep, waking up from their winter sleepover and bursting out of their chrysalids as the day temperatures climb. It warrants a walk out to the butterfly garden to see what's up. Along the way, I stop at bustling Charlie Brown's for a cup of tea with spry and sparkling Karen Tillinghast. She has played a starring role in this book, I have to say. Um, who is, was the lead gardener for Sonoma State University and the founder of the garden. Originally, it was just the bird and butterfly garden, she said, but pretty quickly it became the butterfly garden. The garden was established in 1993 by Tilling Haas and several student assistants as an experiment in learning back native birds and butterflies. Just as they started the project, Mary Merritt from the Santa Rosa Garden Club showed up and immediately adopted the butterfly garden as one of her volunteer projects. Since then, the garden club has been crucial to the garden, with the members digging and scraping and planting and raising funds. It's been a volunteer operation from the start. Her support and enthusiasm for the project and the participation of the Women's Garden Club for funding and volunteering is what made it happen, says Tilly Haas, as we walk past the lakes towards the fire road at the northeast corner of campus. And here's a little tribute they have that they put up for her. And all the butterflies that they lured to the garden. The paved path winds beside the curved concrete banks of the larger of the lakes and continues over the walking bridge to the parking lots on the other side of Copeland Creek. But on this side of the bridge in the planted copes of firs and pines and maples stands an inviting blue sign, the butterfly garden in white large letters. It's a bit cool here in the shade as we turn eastwards onto the fire road, but the tattered edges of the cloud banks are pulling back and we walk forward into a bright patch. We eat the enveloping sun warm and welcoming, best for butterfly sparring, killing half notes. And within seconds, a dark butterfly scoots past our ears to land on a pink flowering currant bush by the planting and potting sheds. That's a pipe vine swallowtail, one of my favorites, says Tillinghast. It looks black at first, but the two hind wings are easily, really an iridescent blue. The caterpillars live on Dutchman pipe vines. The flowers look like a Sherlock Holmes type of pipe. The creek gurgles behind a row of trees on our left. As we walk down the fire road, the sun anointing our heads and shoulders whispering sweet nothings about those warmer days we really should expect out of spring. In quick succession, we spot three other species of butterflies, all common to the garden at this point of the season. Morning cloaks whose soft dark wings are edged in yellow, white cabbage butterflies, flitting white darts, stalks darting around the small meadow, and Ani swallowtails, splendid creatures with cheerful yellow markings that attract the eye. Butterflies along with moths belong to the order Lepidoptera, which contains from 15,000 to 20,000 species around the world. Like most insects, they undergo metamorphosis. That is a dramatic change from youngster to adult. An egg laid on a specific host plant hatches into a larva, aka caterpillar, which must munches steadily into its tiny little heart's content on the host plant, unless picked off by a hungry bird or plant. Uh, sorry, hun hungry bird. Or the plant is chomped by some herbivore, deer or cow or the like. Then following an inner directive, the caterpillar seeks a likely spot somewhere on the plant, somewhere on a leaf, stem, twig bark and enters the pupae stage, spinning a shell around itself, 
known as a chrysalis. Within that shell, the caterpillar basically melts into a soft stew of gooey elements that reconstitutes itself in time into a butterfly. The pupa exists in an extended liminal state in that threshold between the two forms of being, larva and adult. It springs forth from, forth from the chrysalis as a winged creature in dramatic mate enticing colors. When spring days reach a predetermined specific temperature, much like our students, I think, who are just coming off the brain melt and retooling of adolescence and are now, now beginning to shape their adult lives. Butterfly, this is a picture, by the way, of the butterfly garden meadow. I don't know if you ever visited that, you'll see this lovely meadow here with all the particular flowers around it and these lovely butterfly benches for resting them. Um, butterflies have lifespans anywhere from two weeks to two months, depending on the species. The monarchs who live up to 10 months and travel thousands of miles are an extreme exception. Once a butterfly hatches from the chrysalis, its adult life is dedicated to gaining strength and reproducing, generally dying shortly after mating and or laying eggs. Thus, in their short lifespan, the specific arrangements of a butterfly's habitat are critical for survival. Host plants for the caterpillar, nectar flowers for sustenance, sunny basking spots and some water must be easily located. As Tillinghast and her students discovered, all of these care elements need to be in close proximity to each other, or the just hatched butterflies might die before they find nectar, or be too depleted when they locate a larval host plant to lay sufficient eggs. We discovered that a butterfly garden is more than having nectar rich flowers, said Tony Haas. It's really a whole web. The nearby creek provides the water, we planted the nectar and larval host plants within close range of each other. Then we hope for the best. And the best seems to have happened for up to as many as 15 different species have been seen on the annual count on the annual butterfly count weekend held on or around July 4th, not too far off from now, uh, in this small, beautifully created and maintained garden. A college campus is like a butterfly garden, isn't it? We try to have social and intellectual and physical nutrients in close enough proximity so our students, most of them fresh from the gooey meltdown transformative state known as adolescence, have what they need to survive. Safe places for social interactions, plenty of opportunity for physical activities for their growing bodies, intellectual stimulation for the growing brain, cafeterias and coffee shops to fuel it all. Even if the emergent young adult doesn't quite know what sort of butterfly he or she will become, they need the support of a rich and nutritive environment within their grasp to find many options to enrich and sustain their life. Near the end of the fire road, Tilling Hass points out the Dutchman's pipe vine. Indeed, it has tiny little pipe-shaped flowers dangling like earrings along its branchlets though alas, devoid of its dedicated caterpillars. Perhaps the pupae have already hatched and are flitting about as full adults in their black and iridescent blue two-toned wing glory. These are these beautiful, beautiful blue butterflies. Then as we turn to leave, I spot a brief splash of orange, which Tilling has quickly identifies as a painted lady, another common visitor. There is no doubt that Tillinghast has transformed a leftover space into a welcoming oasis for butterflies, that by the dint of her efforts, she has made a check mark in the plus column for nature and our environment. <laughs> and then this is the original uh, sign that was created uh, and is still there.
from here, I thought we would take a little walk around. Maybe if I turn this down, is that better? Okay, so I'm kind of trying kind to of balance between what you can see and what the Zoom people can see, you know, what I can see. Okay, <clears throat> from here, I thought we'd take a little walk around in search of the Dawn Redwood tree because I had heard there was such a tree on campus. Have you ever seen the Don Redwood tree? No. Yeah. yeah. I had heard there was such a tree on campus and that was intriguing to me. Just the name is intriguing, right? And as I learned, that's how it was supposed to be. Oops. The campus, when it was first and vision was designed as an arboretum, including the goal to have trees from every continent. It was a way to organize plantings and structure the vast, then empty spaces of the old seed farms fields. The ginkgos and the dawn redwood were the trees representing Asia. So here we are at the walking bridge. This is the bridge that comes over from the M lots. Um, near the Green Music Center going over Copeland Creek. This side of the creek is still rich in blackberries. And here they are inundating the bridge, swamping the little trees and crowding the banks. In the fall, you walk by there and it smells just like jam. And then here, this is a nice little video, I think you can run it, of the creek in springtime. I don't think we're getting any of the sound, but it does have a lot of birds in it. From here, we will walk down the path again and see um, the big old shaggy eucalyptus there. And then we will go down this path a little bit more for the Japanese maples and the ponds on one side, and some on the other side is a long stretch with some of the back ends of the native habitats that are set up on the back side of campus and the entrance to the butterfly garden as well. Firs and spruces are dot the path. And we end up, once we get past the loquats and the Norway spruce and a fig tree, we get to this particular tree, the Anne Frank horse chestnut tree. I don't know how, do you folks know the story of the Anne Frank tree? Well, I'm here to tell you. Uh, this was planted in 2013. It was one of 13 original offshoots from the original tree that were sent to the United States. This is the original tree, horse chestnut tree that was outside Anne Frank's house. And she would gaze at it from her family's attic hideaway. It was featured in her diary. She wrote about the chestnut tree just on the other side of the wall from her. In this particular quote, nearly every morning I go to the attic to blow the stuffy air out of my lungs. From my favorite spot on the floor, I look up at the blue sky and the bare chestnut tree on whose branches the little raindrops shine, appearing like silver. And at the seagulls and other birds as they glide around on the wind. As long as this exists, I thought, and I may live to see it, this sunshine, the cloud, the skies, while this lasts, I cannot be unhappy. But as we know, her, she and her family did not survive although the tree lasted for, um, until about 2010. Um, and it died more or less of natural causes, or it was 170 years old, that particular tree. And so it's planted kind of at the end of this uh, the, uh, Holocaust and Genocide Memorial sculpture here. This is, uh, this is a tower of glass shards that uh, Jan Nunn put together here. Oh, it glints in the late evening light, in the, in the early morning light. 
And then these are railroad ties, and then these are memorial plaques that put in here. Um, so many offshoots were gifted around the world to various institutions and locations. About 150 are set up in a particular wood in Amsterdam. And these are uh, grown from seedlings that were captured from the original tree. So they knew that it was dying, it was getting old, and they were, they were gonna have to cut it down, they thought at one point. So they started a program where they gathered as many seedlings and cones as they, uh, seedlings as they could, and they planted them, and then they uh, gave these seedlings, the, the little sprouts, out to various institutions. Um, and Sonoma State, uh, through an application process, was selected to be one of the people to receive them. I think there were like 13 that came to the United States. The rest of them went all over the world. And this part of this was because of the Elaine Leader's uh, Holocaust and Genocide Program that she's been uh, working on for many, many years. And also the ability of the gardening staff to care for it because that particular tree had to be in quarantine for three years before they could even plant it. Um, and then the support of local resident Hans Angres, who had gone to the same school in the same years as Anne Frank, prior to each of their families having to go into hiding. There was also a personal connection here uh, between him and Anne Frank. The uh, sapling was planted in April of 2013 and is beginning to thrive. Our own ray of hope in a tumultuous times. So after some moments of contemplation, we continue on in our search for the Dawn Redwood. And remember, this is Dawn, D-A-W-N, not D-O-N. Um, we see uh, a monkey puzzle tree here, um, also known as the Chilean pine. And it, the Chilean, this monkey puzzle, tree is kind of an interesting tree too, because I, I, are you familiar with the, with the structure of the limbs? The little leaves or needles are so tightly woven that it was said that it would take a monkey, even a monkey would puzzle out how to get up that tree. And that's where the monkey puzzle part of its name came from. It's really known as a Chilean pine in other parts of the world. We also have these uh, Mexican fan palm trees here. Watsonia robusta. They're interesting uh, trees, actually. There's so many different kinds of them and they travel all over the world. Although they do theoretically come from one particular spot. It is a favorite nesting tree of the hooded oriole. They weave the palm fibers into a soft sock-like nest and hang it like a hammock underneath the palm fronds. And this is a, a picture of a net, a chick in its nest uh, taken in Katati, actually. The original range of the bird was in Southern California and Mexico, but it has been expanding since the 1930s because people have been planting palm trees all the way up the coast. That Dave Shuford of Marin County Breeding Bird Atlas joked that hooded oriole nests can be referred to by street address. <laughs> Wherever you see, them, <laughs> there, are. Um, there are usually hooded orioles in these palm trees each spring. It takes patience to stay and watch for them. I think by now in June, the chicks will have hatched and fledged. But we do have goslings. Let's see if this is the little movie one. This is uh, the movie I took in April. And you can see the little teeny tiny goslings floating around, having way too much fun. There are a lot of birds and, and little ducklings up there. It's a, kind of a breeding ground actually for many kinds of birds. And then here they are in June. I do not know if this is the same batch of goslings. I don't think so. This is far, this is more. But um, they do thrive there. But we haven't seen the Dawn Redwood yet on campus. This is a picture of a Dawn Redwood. It's in Oakland. Um, 
forget exactly the address of it, but you can find it. It's a beautiful looking tree. And what is the peel of the Don Redwood, known as a Metasequoia glyphosphoroides? It is one of only three species of sequoia extant currently living. But it was only recently discovered, very recently. It was first described and identified from fossil records by a Japanese paleobotanist, Shigeru Miki, in 1941, who identified it as a sequoia like tree that thrived in the Northern Hemisphere, Northern Europe, Greenland, North America, from, from over 150 million years ago. So it's been thriving a long time. And it did, it lived through the time of the dinosaurs. It was present and accounted for for over a hundred million years. And then it seemed to peter out, according to the fossil records, about 40 to 20 million years. And he could find no record of it. And he could find no record of a living example of it. So Shigeru um, Miki declared it extinct in his paper. So this is a wonderful tree, but it's extinct. Then not long after, in 1943, just a couple years later, a professor of forestry, Zhang Wang, traveling in a remote area of China in the Sichuan province, was asked to identify some unique long-lived trees there, long revered by the village. They call the trees water firs for their aff affinity and proximity to water. They really like to be near water. They use the wood for furniture, and structure building, but also built shrines for them and brought offerings and considered them hewn tea trees. Uh, the tea made from their bark is said to like save people lives. The forester, John Wayne, sent a description and samples of needles and bark and seeds and cones to his colleagues. And eventually they got to Harvard trained Chinese botanist, Fen Shu Hu, and he recognized this tree as the same one just written about by Shigeru Miki. The meta sequoia identified him of a fossil record just a few years back. So it's kind of interesting to think of it being not even known about, identified, but identified as lost, and then discovered. And Sen Shu Hu informed the Arnold Arboretum at Harvard. Remember, he graduated from there, so he had connections. Unfortunately, while an expedition was necessary for further investigation, world events did not cooperate, right? We're right in the middle of World War II. So they were not able to send an expedition to it right away. I am going to just make this a long and winding story short um, that finally with the war winding down, an expedition was funded. And in 1944 or 45, a com combination effort of the Arnold Arboretum, UC Berkeley, and the Save the Redwoods League, which sent Ralph Cheney, who might be familiar to many of you, a pioneer botanist of fame and fortune, over to secure samples and saplings. Milton Silverman, journalist with the Chronicle, went along to document the process. And it was he and Cheney who, searching for an emblematic and resonant name, came up with the name Don Redwood. Resonant with the dawn of time, with mystery, with new beginnings. The expedition went with armed guards because of the general unrest after the war, the rising threat of the armed communists. And apparently they ended up shooting a couple people along the way. They fell down when they lost between them, they lost something like 60 pounds each because they were just under such stress and constant movement and probably dysentery <laughs> as far as I know. But, and as, so it was really quite an adventure to get to the Sichuan province in those days. I mean, it was, they had to take boats and use mules and it was a trek. An apocryphal story goes as they came back to customs in Hawaii, a customs official wouldn't allow, 
the four pounds of seeds and cones to pass and threatened to destroy them all. And you can imagine that they were just about ready to have a conniption right then and there. there the story goes that a, pa a, a fellow passenger, like a traveler that's nearby suggested, they think about how old these seeds were, how old the species was. And they convinced the guard that since these species, the species was a million years old, that they could count it as antiquity. So as an antiquity, they could pass through. This was a major find, uh, the Arnold Arboretum decided or declared. This once unknown tree, then identified, then considered extinct, and then found living within a matter of few years. It was the tree of the century, according to, to the Arnold Arboretum, and their symbol became a drawing of the Don Redwood. The saplings and cones and seeds were cultivated and then shared all over the world to our breedums, institutions, devoted gardeners in the 50s and 60s to see where the tree would flourish. But they went once again thrived in our climate. And they did prove to be hardy. With trees once again thriving in Northern Europe and North America. There are several trees right here in the Bay Area in Oakland, Berkeley, San Francisco, and of course, right here at Sonoma State. And I don't know that they, this, the, the one here at Sonoma State was necessarily one of the ones that came out from the first batch of seedlings and cones that were shared, but maybe second or third generation because the campus was, didn't really start until the late 60s. So it's kind of after that, but here it is. After rounding the corner near International Hall, here is the little Don Redwood. I call it little. Uh, it's near the ponds, just next to the art building. It's tall and spindly. Most people walk by it daily. And as you can see in this slide, it is the smallest, this slide here, it is a, ooh, what happened? Oh, here's the other view of it. This is the other side. This really shows the kind of the nice height of the smallest uh, sequoia. Because this is the slide. Um, if you can see, this is the Don Redwood here. And this is the giant sequoia, which is, is kind of considered giant because of its mass, right? It just has an enormous amount of mass. But the coastal redwood is the tallest and it grows over up to 400 feet tall. And even though this is considered small, it does often gets over hundred feet, 120 feet. So it's really only small in comparison, but it's, it is kind of a dainty tree for a redwood. <laughs> it's really a cute little tree. It ha has the cutest little cones here. There's a little green one. What question? Yes. Yeah, that sounds great. And we can. We can add that to the roster. Mm -hmm. A stand or just oh, oh, oh well, that's good. Oh, ah, uh, yes, exactly. Yes, they the they're they do it. This is very true. And when they first, they, you do think that. And when you go by this in the fall, you think, oh God, that tree's really suffering. And that is, it is a deciduous conifer. Yes. Oh, see, they, they did send those seeds far and wide. They really wanted to see what would happen. Yes. Yeah, they wanted just off the down Okay. Look across the meadow. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to have have you guys write down all these locations. I won't do it now, but we will get them. It does have these cute little cones uh, with the pairs of scales set at right angles to each other, uh, like the connections in Lincoln Logs, right? So they are, make a tight fit and a compact shape. The needles are feathery and soft. 
gentle to the touch, the bark reddish and also soft, not as harsh as the other redwoods. Interestingly enough, this is a deciduous conifer, as you said, the only one, only deciduous sequoia rather, meaning it drops its leaves in winter and we leave them in spring. It does have a lovely warm, uh, here's some more pictures of it. This is the bark here. It's really, this doesn't look like a redwood tree, does it to you? It has a very different kind of bark. But these, this looks very red, was this? And this is the tree leaves in, in fall. See how red in the, uh, the gets? It's like a lovely warm brown. And pictures of the remaining groves in China in the fall are delightful. And so I actually up here, I have some examples of redwood cones and dawn redwood cones to look at. So we'll head our way back out the way we came more imaginatively than figuratively as we turn to the M lot and the um, walking bridge. And here's a picture of the blackberries to us pictures of the evening. So uh, we, if we have time, I can read one more or we can stop here and we can have, take questions. I'd be happy to answer any questions. You need one more? Okay, I will read one more called Black. Okay, this one is called Blackberry Love. One day it arrives, the tipping point, a warm, may, maybe even hot day, sunny, but with a thin wind carrying the merest touch, that slightest nip of Arctic air. A chill, not a fog bank and ocean, but dry, stern, the real deal. Summer sliding into fall. There'll be more warm days, maybe even some hot days, but the announcement has been made. Walking across the Emlot Bridge on my way to the office in early September, I was assailed by the jammy smell of blackberries baking in these last hot weeks, a final fling of bariness before subsiding into vast green mats of picked over brambles. We all have our favorite locations on campus, those sweet spots of berry lust that we may or may not share with our compadres. Those with patience have been known to collect enough for pies, hearts, and jams. They're the ones who carry bowls and cups. The rest of us, well, we just pick and gobble on our breaks, <laughs> hoping to hide our purple stained thorn pricked fingers when we return to the office. Those blackberry vines, however, are a double thorn plant treat as well as threat. As fruit, they are the best. Nice nitly packets, plucked straight from the vine, rich in antioxidants, an explosion of warm nectar on the tongue. But what we see around campus and just about anywhere else in Sonoma County is not a native species of berry, but the invasive Himalayan blackberry, Rubus armenicus. Um, a very aggressive, prolific species originally from Eurasia, but a pest that has now rambled and brambled everywhere, particularly the Americas and Australia. They devastate the complex integrated relationships of a native biome, crowding out the native species and cre creating a monoculture of brambles and thickets, thorns and berries. Yummy berries, but still, their home records. These vines grow remarkably quickly, sometimes inches a day, up to 10 feet a year. They have swarmed the banks of Copeland Creek, overwhelming bushes and taking down the trees that provide the tall shade necessary for salmon fry, choking the sunlight and oxygen from plants and creek alike. Their vicious thorns can be too much for native animals, trapping them rather than protecting them as the gentler, kinder, native California blackberry, Rubus ursinus, does. Oh, the bear, bear bear. The roots of the Himalayan are shallow, providing poor erosion control. The presence of one measly leaf can strike fear in the heart of any landscaper or property manager, for blackberry vines can be nigh unto impossible to eradicate without diligent and aggressive attention. Sure you all have experienced this. 
They seem to thrive on being yanked out. Any left, any little piece left in dirt will root. Their canes stretch out several yards long, creating daughter plants anywhere they touch dirt. Their pollinated seeds are dropped everywhere from the gut of fruit delirious birds. Everyone has their favorite berry picking spots. Some folks favor the bushes that run between the south bank of the creek and the fire road. Others go straight over the walking bridge to the north bank. Long and thick bushes run along the creek on both sides of the bridge with little scallops where people stand and pick their fingers purple and bleeding. Mine spot near the butterfly garden is scheduled to be removed and has since been. Understandably enough, as it is as it's been escaping from the creek banks, and the gardeners want them out now. But there's a path along the inner bank of the old track, albeit scraggly looking and yelling now that I've been on. But that's not the half of it. There's a mother load on campus, a berry patch to end all berry patches, stuck out in the wild lands to the west of the end parking lot the northernmost and most remote lot in campus city. Even then, there's a bit of bushwhacking along an overgrown disc golf course path. Thick precautions, and then a narrow deer path out to the middle of a vacant field. The sun warmed the dusty grasses as they clomp out there, and grasshoppers chirp and flip up. The vine mounds are quite visible and follow some old pasture or paddock fencing, their bones buried deep within. But they still bear structure to the mounds. And as I walk around the soft corner, I come to the gate and enter a variable four walled room of berries, berries, and berries. It's like this, isn't it? We don't see the abundance in front of our eyes. We don't notice the richness of our own campus and the sustenance it provides, not just to the students who are immersed in the richness of their studies, but to all of us who work here. This state of lusciousness abundance we so easily ignore or dismiss. We hustle on our errands, always trying to catch up, provide this or that, obtain another bit of security. We shop at big box stores because somehow one large package of cereal just isn't enough. We feel a lack in our lives. We, we feel poor somehow. And yet our abundance could be right there under our noses. So way the blackberries, undesirable, yet so darn delicious, thrive in pockets and patches all over campus. It only takes a few minutes to stop and fill our baskets, cups, and and we are suddenly rich in berries and deliciousness and the essence of summer sweetness and the nectar of life. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>